uh, we also saw there uh, that the, a, the, the key was uh, recycled, right? So the, the key is here ABC and it's again ABC. So if there was the letter H here and the letter H here, it would be replaced by the same uh, symbol. So it would be result in the same ciphertext. Now, um, what we do if we if we just fry over or not, no, let, let me just put it like this. That's it. So we know if we just use a, a shift cipher where we don't, so not the VGR cipher, but we replace everything by the same thing, then I, I told you before, it was invariant, this index of coincidence, which means that the index of coincidence remains the same, even if we just replace it always by another character. So if we replace it always by the same character, this it doesn't matter if it's an H or if it's an A. We, we count the number of H's as the same as the number of A's. But so the, this, 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 this number, the index of coincidence will remain the same even though we apply this cryptographic transformation. But now in this Fisinger cipher, we, we, we do change the index of coincidence because not the, the letter L is not always replaced by the O. It's sometimes replaced by the O, sometimes by the M, and sometimes even by some other character by the um, N, um, probably. Um, so uh, we don't know. Uh, so this index of coincidence will will change. So the the we yeah, just keep that in mind. But now um, we want to try different candidates of key lengths. And see if we can come if if we, so. What what we will do in the in the assignment is actually using the Hamming weight instead of the index of coincidence, and just because the Hamming weight works better for this XOR ciphers, but the index of coincidence could also work there. So they're interchangeably; they're both techniques you could use. Um, but what you do there is you you iterate over various key lengths. And see and compute every time the index of coincidence or the Hamming distance. The, you just compute some statistics about the language. And now, if you if you if you at a certain point end up with a number which is super close to the language that you are looking for, for example, English, then you know you've probably found the 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 right key length, and you can continue, uh, maybe do twice the key length that you found. And if this also gives you again the the number uh, that you are looking for, the, the English language, uh, then it it's very likely that you found the key, and then you can actually take the lower of these. Because if you if I have the key ABC ABC, that's the same as if I only had the key ABC. So if you had twice the key length, that's the same as once the key length. So you will find for every multiple of your of the original key length, you will find that the, the, the index of coincidence or the Hamming weight is super close to the one you expect for a natural language. I hope this was clear a bit. Otherwise, please read up on this in the book or online. There are lots of this uh, practical cryptography where I got these numbers for. They also explain it. There, there are lots of tons of, uh, of things, uh, resources you can find online where they explain how, why computing this index of coincidence or this Hamming weight will uh, help you to determine, um, yes, that, that the right letter is replaced again by the same letter. Because that's where we're looking for. So the probability that the letter L is again replaced by the, uh, for example, that the letter O is replaced by the letter O. And again, that the letter L is again replaced by the letter O, and that only occurs at every third position if there is an L in that original plain text. So that's what we're just computing with this index of coincidence or this Hamming weight. So like I said, it's not super easy to explain this, but just read for yourself. Hopefully you will, um, you will get a better understanding on why we actually use this, the, the probability that two letters are the same. Okay, and then um, I got some questions about uh, the homework. Uh, before I answer 
any questions if there are here for in the room um, about uh, how, how to prove things. So I, let me be clear, I'm really not looking for examples. So you really have to prove something. So for example, when we had uh, this, um, uh, you had to prove that the statistical distance between X and Y is the same as the statistical distance between Y and X, then it, it, doesn't, it doesn't suffice to just think of replace this X by a random variable that you make up, but you really have to prove it for all var random variables X and all random variables Y. So, um, well, that's how you have to prove. And um, then the, the proofs also re re uh, require you to prove if and only if. And that means, um, so sometimes you, for, for example, see that, um, uh, I hope you, you know logic well enough, but otherwise I explain it uh, um, in this case. If it rains, I will bring my umbrella. That means that if it rains, I will bring my umbrella and I won't necessarily bring my umbrella. If it, uh, then if I bring my umbrella, it not, doesn't always rain. So it could be raining or not if I bring my umbrella, but if it rains, I will always bring my umbrella. But now I, I require you in these proofs, I say proof if and only if. That means if and only if it rains, I will bring my umbrella. That means that if it rains, I will bring my umbrella. And if I, if I bring my umbrella, you can be sure it rains. And if I don't bring my umbrella, then you can also be sure it doesn't rain because otherwise I would have brought my umbrella. So these proofs you have to, so I, for example, the first assignment, uh, uh, A, uh, you have to prove um, that uh, the, the statistical distance between, uh, I believe you have to prove that it's zero if and only if uh, the, the, the two, statistical, um, yeah, X, the two statistical uh, variables, random variables are the same. So they, um, they have the same, uh, have same distribution. So now you have to show first one way, let's say if the statistical distance is zero, you have to show that X and Y have the same statistical distance, uh, distribution, sorry. And you also have to show that if X and Y have the same statistical uh, distribution, then the uh, statistical distance will be zero. So you have to actually show two things by uh, in these things where there is the question for if and only if. So please remind, re remember yourself this. And that's also why the question has two points assigned to it. Because if you only show one way, I will give you only one point. If you show both ways, I will give you two points. Uh, so I hope that at least clarifies and I hope everybody will be able to prove these things. And just remind yourself, it's, uh, it's, it's really needed to just prove for general cases and not just give an example. You can always give an example for a counter example. So if you have to prove that something is never occurring or uh, um, you have, so let's say I claim this is always occurring, but I say, well, prove me wrong. Then you can just show one example, a counter example, and then you proved already. But in this case, it, it won't work. You have to prove it for all cases. So that's clear. Um, are there any other questions about the homework or course so far, which are not that specific that it's better maybe to ask on Slack? If not, then um, I will continue with the today's lecture. Um, I'll stop this screen sharing and start this presentation. Uh, 
can now start the screen sharing again. So hopefully this is, yes, this is uh, online. Okay, so starting with uh, the topic information theoretic security. That's what we will cover today. And we will see that there are crypto systems which are proven, uh, which are which, which you can prove to be always unbreakable. So no matter what kind of techniques you will use, you cannot break. So you, you can be sure that it, with information theoretic security, encryption will be impossible to break. But there, there's a catch and we will get to it during the, the class. So let's first uh, recap a bit what we've learned uh, from the last lectures. We've, we've seen several historic ciphers, the shift, the substitution, and the uh, Visionaire cipher, and we've seen how to break them. So we know they're insecure. And then, of course, the question arises, and that's actually also historically, the question arose, like, how can we define security so that we know we can say, ah, it is secure and this is not secure? And um, specifically, how can we de define confidentiality? That's what we're looking after for uh, cryptography, for, for uh, encryption, sorry. And how can we then maybe make some model and really prove that these uh, crypto systems are secure under a certain model? So we have to model the, the real world under some constraints to be able to prove, well, in this model, the, 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 we can prove our crypto system secure. For this class, we will only focus on the first two and uh, how to model and prove security, we will cover uh, in the next lecture. And that will be really information theory, um, um, will be really informatics or computer theory. Uh, where we will use also complexity classes and reductions and uh, those things. So maybe if you already had some complexity classes and things like uh, which are already referred to like Turing machines. And if you know uh, things, some things about this, that's really what we will use in this, in this uh, lecture and in the, the next lecture. And we will use it also throughout the course where, for example, for mostly in uh, the public key crypto um, if we will cover those uh, crypto systems, we will prove like reductions with, um, well, um, um, uh, probabilities and uh, well, um, re reduce one algorithm to our crypto system and stuff like this. But so far, we will first define on how can we define security and what does it mean for something to be secure. So. I'll just give you directly a definition of perfect uh, secrecy. And that is basically what it means to have a crypto system which is, uh, is, is perfectly hiding the underlying message. And what, is it, uh, what does the definition actually say? It says a crypto system is perfectly secure if, and then the formula exists for all playtext and for all ciphertext. So let's have a look at the formula. It says, if the probability of a plain text uh, that if we if we if the probability of a plain text is a certain message under the condition that the ciphertext is a certain ciphertext that's the same as we just pick an arbitrary message or that the the message was sent so basically what this means is that if we if we get a plain text and we know the ciphertext, we actually learn nothing about this, about this, about this uh, message. Uh, so actually it's, I, I said, if we get the plain text, that's not correctly, but we say, if we get a ciphertext, uh, the, the message that this ciphertext en uh, encodes or uh, encrypts, um, we learn as much as just how often this message would occur. So for example, if I have a, if I have a message 
uh, A, uh, and I have a message B, but the probability that A occurs is 0.7, and the probability that I will send message B is just 0.3. Uh, that's just this probability. Now, if I encrypt something and uh, my encryption gives the number uh, 101. So I use some encryption te technique and I get just as a ciphertext, I get the number 101. Then what this, what this definition says, if, it's, if my encryption technique is perfectly secure, then getting this uh, encryption 101 won't re uh, will we won't review anything about the underlying plain text. Namely that the probability that I encrypted the message A and it became 101 is exactly the same, or that is um, the probability that, uh, yeah, I encrypted message A and it became 101 is just 0.7 uh, probability. But the, uh, and the same the message B could also be encrypted and return into 101 with the probability 0.3. Because yes, uh, I don't learn anything more about what is encrypted just by knowing. If you know, well, I I send more often the message A, then the SARF text won't 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 hide this because you just know you send more often the letter A. But you don't know whether it's now the letter A or it's now the letter B. You just know, oh, okay, often you will send the letter A, but nothing else. So this is clear what is what this definition really entails and what it means. Um, and then there's also a footnote which says the terms perfect secrecy, information theoretic security, uh, uh, also uh, perfectly secure, they're all basically the same. Um, so I will use them interchangeably, but now you already see the, 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 the title of this lecture was information theoretic security. And we already see basically the definition of information theoretic security, which is that you won't learn anything more from a plain from a ciphertext than just what you already knew about me sending more times A's than more than B's. So you won't learn anything more uh, than that you already knew. Okay, so now we have a nice definition and we can prove some things about this uh, definition. So there's a lemma which says, if we have a perfect uh, secrecy, so if we go one step back, it meant that the probability of uh, the, the plain text under the condition of a ciphertext, given a ciphertext equals, well, the, equals the probability that we just have a plain text. This lemma says that we can also swap these two. So basically that if we, the probability of some ciphertext occurring, knowing that we encrypt a certain message is the same as the ciphertext occurring, not knowing uh, the message, uh, a certain message is encrypted. Basically it means that, well, the every ciphertext will occur with a certain probability. And we, we, again, we don't learn anything about which message was encrypted. I hope you see what this means. And we can also try to prove this, uh, this uh, thing. And here we just, how, do, how we prove you, this is using the Bayes theorem. Uh, hopefully you learned that also maybe in the previous class. <laughs> Um, and what does this theorem says is a super useful theorem because we can compute something with these probabilities or conditional probabilities. And basically it says, well, if you, you can um, take up, you can basically, well, swap out this uh, conditional probability by division. 
Um, but yeah, so this is just applying Bayes' theorem and you will see that this equals this. And now, because we know of the definition of perfect secrecy, which was written here on the whiteboard, we can just replace, uh, we know that this part, this probability that the message under the condition of a certain ciphertext equals the probability of just a certain message that's just written here. So we can cancel out this term against this term, and we just indeed left, we are left with this probability that the ciphertext equals some ciphertext. So now we've proven this, this lemma, and we know that we can basically swap this two and it will still be uh, correct. So moving on to the next lemma, so also some property of perfect secrecy. So we, why, why do we cover these lemmas? Is to get a bit of a feeling of what does it mean to be perfectly <laughs> secure. So um, this lemma says, uh, if we have the key space, the ciphertext space and the plain text space, then we know that the plain, the key space, the, sorry, the ciphertext space needs to be at least as big as the plain text space, and the key space needs to be at least as big as the ciphertext space. But this first one, I hope it's obvious to everybody that this always needs to hold because uh, if we if we if we if we have a plain text, um, uh, if we have maybe three plain texts and we only have two ciphertext possible ciphertext, that would mean that not every every we won't have deterministic encryption because then by the pigeonhole principle, maybe you also know this, uh, we, we basically have map two plain text to one sarf text. So we don't, we don't, if we have only two sarf text, we don't know what it was, the plain text. So we always need to have at least the num same number of uh, sarf texts in, uh, for every plain text. I hope that's clear. Um, I've done actually this proof in steps. So that's, 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 that's written here. So this is what we already know because otherwise we won't have nice encryption. We will lose information about what is encrypted. So for the next step, we also know um, that the probability that a SARF text is, um, is occurring is, is just, for uh, its uh, uh, probability is always equal zero, equal or greater than zero. And this is just the definition of perfect security. Remember that? Um, or it's actually the other. It's not a, it's not a perfect, uh, definition of perfect security, but it's, we used this from the previous lemma. So we just wrote, okay, we have this because we just explained, and we have this statement about perfect secrecy. But what we can also do now is uh, modify that formula that we have here. We replace how these sarf, uh, these, uh, these sarf text, they are, of course, they don't come out of nothing. They are actually created by our encryption algorithm. So let's see what happens if we replace this sarf text by actually the thing in our encryption algorithm. So I just wrote it down like this. This is uh, this, this probability we didn't change at all. We, we just say that uh, we had this conditional here, so that's still there, I didn't change that. But I said here, here there was this, the probability of a SARF text equals some value of C. Well, we can replace that by a certain, that the SARF text will be fixed, but of course it depends on the key that we choose. So we also still have the key, and actually this could also be non-deterministic, it could be a probabilistic algorithm, but um, for simplicity, you can also assume it's deterministic. It doesn't matter in this case. Um, but uh, I hope you agree that I just I, I could just replace the previous formula by this one, uh, and now we 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 just have a probability over the key space and actually a probability over this encryption algorithm. Why did I do this? Because now we can say something about this formula. So. What does, what does this mean? For each message M, um, yes, there at, ex, uh, exists at least one key such that this encryption uh, will, will yield 
this value C. And that's basically what we see here because we, we will get the, the probability that we get a certain encryption or will, it will depend on the encryption algorithm itself if it's probabilistic, but if you don't get it, just assume it's deterministic and the, the, the key that we pick. So for, for the, 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 the encryption will basically depend on the key if we fix a certain message, if we know if we encrypt a certain message, then basically the encryption outcome will only depend if it, if it's a deterministic encryption algorithm, will only depend on the the key that we choose. And we know that there are uh, so basically that also means that the number of keys needs to be bigger than or equal to the number of ciphertext because multiple keys can map to the same ciphertext, but we need to have at least 10 keys if we want to have 10 ciphertexts, because otherwise, let's say, as an example, let's say the message is uh, A or hello. Now, to get to 10 different ciphertexts of the message hello, we need to have at least 10 different keys. We can also have 12 different keys, then two keys map to the same ciphertext. That could all be very well true, but we need to have at least 10 different keys. Hopefully this was also correct, uh, you could follow it. Otherwise these proofs are really well, they're written with way more text in the, in the textbook. So you can always read them uh, back uh, if, you, uh, if you prefer. Actually, I won't cover all proofs for all uh, theorems and lemmas throughout this uh, class. Uh, sometimes it's, I find it way more convenient. When I was a student, I find it way more convenient to follow the, the proof from a written book, because then you can just take the steps and think about it your, at your own pace. But um, for simple or not super extensive proofs, I will either give a proof intuition or I will cover it uh, in words uh, during the class. Okay, so now we already uh, very at the beginning of this course, of this lecture, uh, we will already see one of the main and very important theorems of this entire lecture. And this is actually a theorem due by Shannon. There was a guy in the 1800, 1700, 1900. I, uh, sorry, I am very bad with uh, years, but uh, it's uh, some time ago, uh, but he worked all, only on information theory. So he defined what was information. Maybe you actually learned about this person already at other courses, maybe at network, uh, network courses, because he also had lots of consequences for networking and compression algorithms, because, well, how much can you compress a text? That is basically how much information there is in the text. So, and he formulated this uh, theorem um, and that goes as follows. If we have a certain encryption, encryption uh, scheme or crypto system, uh, namely with some a plain text space, a cipher text space, key space, an encryption algorithm and a decryption algorithm. Then we can say this crypt, uh, crypto system will be perfectly secure if and only if, so remember again, this is uh, both ways. If and only if every key is used with equal probability. So the probability that we will use a certain key is just one out of every key. And uh, if the, for every message and ciphertext, there's a unique key such that we generate a certain ciphertext. Um, or yeah, actually you could also, yeah. So for every, yes, it's, it's, it's written correctly there. So for, we, we basically a, a way of viewing this is uh, we can get every ciphertext, uh, by changing the keys. So if we, if we fix a message and we fix the ciphertext, we can, we can always find a key that will convert that message into a certain ciphertext. It also says that if we, for example, fix the, the, the key, uh, the ciphertext and the key, we will always find a message that will, that will make this formula hold. So pick two and fix them, and you can always find the third one, which will make this formula hold. That's basically what this says. 
And this is just an important theorem. And I think, ah, no, this, this one apparently has a bigger proof. So this one is a bit complicated to explain during the class. So this one, I, I, I hope you will read for yourself and take a note and understand why this will actually work. An intuition is, well, maybe the first bullet makes a lot of sense because if we would pick always key number one, instead of uh, we have uh, 10 different keys, but we always pick key number one, of course, our encryption system will maybe work very well. But if somebody other party also knows we always pick encryption key number one, of course, he can easily decrypt the message because he will just use encryption key number one and he can decrypt. So we will definitely always want to have that we pick the key uniformly at random. So every key is equally likely to, to be picked. So th this this bullet, first bullet is hopefully very easy to understand. It's clear that we really need to have this property. For this other property, um, that is hopefully it's clear that you, you, we already saw it here in this uh, in this lemma um, that we uh, we we were, yes here hopefully you got a bit of an idea that we. For every SARF text, there has to be at least one key available. And that's basically also what we say here. Uh, there, for every SARF text and plain text combination, there is a unique key such that this is. And the intuition behind this is basically that, um, uh, let me think. Um, the encryption key, um, basically it means um, the intuition is that no matter, it's it's very close to the, the, the thing that we saw to perfect uh, secrecy, um, at least to me, is that it basically, if we get just a SARS text, we don't learn anything about what this message was because maybe if we fix a key, then it could be any message. And if we fix the message, it could be any key. So basically, this is basically what perfect secrecy, the definition said. And hopefully it will be, it's clear that this is basically the same thing. And if we combine this with this probability that we every key is as likely to be chosen, we actually provide, we actually have that indeed this is perfect secrecy, the definition that we had before. So if it wasn't completely clear, please read at your own pace in the book because there you can find all the, the, the proofs and details uh, um, as before. Okay, now we will see, um, we will see does actually some uh, an encryption scheme exists that meets this definition of uh, perfect secrecy. Um, and maybe we can prove it using these things or another way. But um, the question is, oh, sorry, I'm going too quickly. Uh, is, does such an encryption scheme exist? Well, I already told you before, actually, yes, these encryption schemes exist, but, um, and the, the, this is called the one-time path. Uh, an example of such an encryption scheme is called the one-time path. And what is the one-time path? It's basically the Vigiero cipher, but with a key as long as the plain text. So for the Vigiero cipher, we reuse the key. So we, remember on the previous slide, on the previous class, we had this hello, and then we had ABC, and we reused AB in order to encrypt the rest of the, of the plain text. And we would reuse all the time ABC, 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 ABC. But now if we would, would choose something complete random key and we choose it as long as the plain text, then actually we'll get a perfectly secure encryption cipher. So actually it's also, sometimes it's also called the Ver, Vernam cipher because that's some guy who uh, wrote it down first. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's called the one-time path. 
And actually the Vernum cipher is really where this operation is a XOR operation and not this modulo operation where we shift the, the letters. Um, so from now on, I will just always assume that this is the XOR operation. Um, okay, what was this definition to encrypt the plain text M under a key uh, K, where both the plain text M and the key are of the same length. And if we compute just the XOR between these two things, and then we get just the plain text. That's, that's how this works. So um, fairly simple to describe. You will see, hopefully you will see immediately one big problem of this cipher of, of this encryption technique. It's not really practical. Does anybody have an idea why, why isn't this super practical? How do you distribute the key? How do you distribute the key? Because exactly, this is a very good question because if I, if I have a key, like if I want to send a message of 10 kilo, kilobytes, I first need to distribute the key of 10 kilobytes to the other party for him to decrypt my message. But if I can, and this key needs to be secure, right? Otherwise it doesn't make any sense. So if I can give him the key securely, then I could have just given him the plain text securely at first already. That's an underlying problem of? With symmetric algorithms? Well, actually we'll see, for example, AES, which has a super small encryption key and a super small decryption key. Uh, but you can still, uh, you can encrypt way more longer message than the key um, with AES. So the problem here is really that the key is as long as the plain text. So yeah, it's super annoying, but uh, still this is used sometimes. And that's what we'll head to next is uh, in World War One and Two, the people printed out lots of small papers with just only codes and just, you see here numbers written, and these are just encryption keys. So you, if, you, if, if, if they would have to send a message from the battlefront back to uh, headquarters, they would use just a book. They had already, they brought a book with them with just only random numbers. And they use these random numbers to encrypt the, the message. And they can be sure that in transit, this message was, unbreakable you couldn't you couldn't decrypt it because we just showed or we i just told you that this one time path or van van fair num cipher uh is uh, an example of a perfect uh encryption scheme so you cannot break it there is no way an intuition by the way maybe i should have told you already at the last slide uh, an intuition um or maybe i should ask you do, do you have an can you maybe explain or in intuitive ways of why, why can't you never, uh, if I give you an, a SARF text encrypted using this, uh, this encryption scheme, why won't you be able to learn what the underlying message is? Think about it maybe for a, a minute. The key space is too big. The key space is too big. True, the, the, the key space is huge because it's as long as the message. Maybe something else. It's close to this, uh, this what we already seen here before, like every key and the, 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 the thing that is very intuitive to me is to see why this, this you, you, you won't ever be able to break is that if I give you some ciphertext, any plain text could be underneath there because I could, for, if I give you the SARF text, uh, well, some, some, some message, then I could claim, then I could find a message and a key pair, which would encrypt to this SARF text. But I could also find another message and a key pair, which would encrypt to the exact same part, SARF text. I could find dozens, I could find, the the well almost infinite but the same number as there are possibilities of possible messages of that length like all these pos all these messages of that length i can find an encryption key that will make it work 
that this that you that you have this encryption uh, key that I gave you, or this uh, uh, ciphertext, sorry, that I gave you. So, it, it, given you, uh, if I give you a ciphertext, then every message could be under can be encrypted. Um, could every if I any message that I encrypt under a certain key could result into this ciphertext that I gave you. Is that clear? So let me try to explain it one more time. So if I give you a ciphertext, uh, a, a certain, um, uh, maybe uh, I just give an example, maybe um, I, um, let's say uh, seven, uh, 73 in hex. Now, my claim is that this could be any uh, any other hex number that was encrypted as a plain that uh, every every plain text of a, of a this is a byte right or no this is two bytes right yes yes um, or sorry no one um, the um, so uh, we 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 can um, so for example the okay I'll just give you examples. <laughs> So if I had the plain text zero zero, then sorting this with the key uh, seventy three would re result in this sarf text. But if I had the message one, sorting this with the key seventy two probably. Yes, because it's soaring, and then I think an uh, even number with an uneven number will result in an uneven number. So I hope this is correct. But uh, I then this this sarf text uh, we can also arrive to this sarf text. The same goes for if if the original message was just two, then we can also find some other key seventy whatever. I don't dare to write it now, <laughs> uh, but that will also result in this uh, SARF text 73. Same for the value three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, until FF. All possible messages uh, with a, have a corresponding key, which will result in this SARF text. So hopefully this is some intuition on why why this is so we can never find a decryption key for this yes a question is it on no good all right thank you so yeah my question is like so when would be a good or a good case to use this because then the what I can see is that we have a multiple enumeration, so the cost is enormous here. Right. Yes, and we, so yeah. if we, it's, we can iterate over all things, but we don't know still, it, the message could very well be zero, zero, and we don't have any way of distinguishing. So if I, if I encrypt the words, uh, uh, hello, uh, and it will, give you some sarf text it could also be uh the words uh tally, for example i mean uh that's also a very that's also an, an equally valid word so but we don't know whether hello was encrypted or tally because we can find encryption keys which will we will make the the sarf text to encrypt uh, decrypt to hello but also sarf text to decrypt to tally Thank you. Okay, I'll raise this a bit and then move on to the next slide about the drawbacks, or maybe we should have a break. Uh, yes, maybe it's a good time to have a short break and let's continue again at, uh, at uh, six or five past six.
Okay, um, let's start again. Uh, I also want to mention something about the homework. Uh, the at the end of the when the when everybody has to hand in the homework, I will also release my uh, solutions to the homework uh, set, so you can already check how uh, well how I proved these things, and you can maybe already see okay I've done it correctly, or I should have written this and this in order to do it correctly. So I'm not sure if I will always release the uh, the sample solutions to the homeworks. But uh, I will certainly do it for the first one. And maybe if there is a need that it's, uh, I see that uh, the question is uh, badly uh, or not correctly answered uh, a lot of times, then I will also just release uh, the answer so you can learn from it and how, how you could have written it correctly. Um, so getting back to this uh, one-time path. So there are uh, several drawbacks of using this one plant path. We already discussed these things. The first thing was already key distribution because you need to give you somebody else already a key as long as the plain text. Uh, and that's kind of annoying because then you could have sold, told him the message already up front. So what, but this is actually used in the second world war, for example. So soldiers were, given uh, when they were at their base, they were given just these code books, which were just all random numbers. And they would just go to the battlefield. And if then they want to have set, they would want to have, they would want to send a message back to headquarters. They could just encode the message using this code book, one time path. And then uh, some guy would run back to headquarters or so and give the message. And they would have exactly the same code book so they could decrypt the message um, to see well what's going well on the battlefield or terrible whatever um, so but you really have to keep of course all your key material secret so they print it on a super small sheet of paper so these these this now it's really huge on a projector but these books were really like this format so they're really small books where you really had to look at uh, what numbers were written there in order to encode your message. Another uh, drawback of using this one-time path is that you really can only use your key once. Remember, if you use your key twice or multiple times, we basically had the Vigier cipher. So it's really important to only use your key once because otherwise we completely destroy the security of this crypto system. And why? Well, this is just applying. Let's see what happens if we uh, if we have two ciphertexts, ciphertext one and ciphertext two, which are encrypted under the same key. Well, then we can just compute the XOR between ciphertext one and ciphertext two. And what does it mean? Well, ciphertext one is encrypted message one under the key, and ciphertext two is message two encrypted under the same key. Well. If we know how to apply this XOR operation, we know that if we XOR some message with a key, XOR some message with the same key, then this key cancels out this key. So we basically end up with the XOR between message one and message two. And of course, here we can do all kinds of statistical analysis about letter frequencies and all kinds of things, but because this is just two times an English uh, letter. So there are examples of uh, things uh, of, of messages exchanged in World War II where they reuse the key or actually also the Enigma machine. They could have sometimes see that the, the key were used twice or, and they basically it means that if you have two times uh, use the same key and you can get hold of two, the message one sort with a message two, you learn lots of information about the underlying messages. If you if your message is long enough, and you can recover both messages sometimes even. So this is really hard work and lots of trial and error and lots of knowledge about languages. But basically, you destroy your entire encryption scheme because you 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 leak lots of information about your underlying messages. So this is the major part of security of this uh, one-time path really means one time. So you really cannot use reuse your keys. 
because of this property. And then there is a, a third property, which is really important for using this runtime path is you have to, your key has to be chosen at random. And if you don't choose your key really purely at random, so if it's not a uniformly random key, so remember with this Shannon theorem, theorem we said, every key should be as likely to pick. Well, if we always pick key number one instead of uh, out of all possible keys, then your crypto system will also be ruined. It will be super bad because we can predict which keys will be used. So that's why for a one-time path, you really need to use, you need, really need to generate your randomness securely. Um, there is also in the lab assignment, I find a super nice assignment where we will use a very crappy random number generator. Uh, and we can, but because we use a, a wrong lab random number generator, which isn't random at all, we can predict the next, next random uh, bits. Uh, we can completely uh, decrypt a message. So that's just remember, always use good randomness when using cryptography, because if, you're, if your randomness is not good, then basically all falls apart. A question? Yeah. We're looking for the microphone. I, I was wondering, I may be outdated with this, but those computers produce really random numbers. My understanding is they produce only pseudo random numbers. Yes, so um, computers use, they, you can actually use a hardware, hardware random number generator. And then for example, one way of using this is listening to the statistical noise generated in the universe. And then, so the white noise you see on the television, that's we do not as humans see any pattern in there. So we say that's pure randomness. Uh, another way of doing this is, for example, with quantum technology, splitting light beams, and uh, then you have the quantum, it's left or right or complicated stuff. But at least where we can also say, well, this just probability half, it will be this, or probability half, it will be that. But indeed, in practice, not every computer has a random hardware, random number generator built in. So we will use things that are looking random enough. So this, this Linux kernel is a bit infamous for really weird stuff like you have def random and you have def u random, which where the u says for unblock. So you have uh, uh, unconditional uh, randomness and the, the normal def random actually will have some concept of an entropy pool, which says if it, the numbers that are generated will still be random enough. And if it's not random enough, it will stop generate, generating the random numbers. And well, we'll you will have to wait before you to move the mouse and do all kinds of network traffic. And then it says, okay, I, I just took all these sources and from these sources, they are sort of randomness. I can generate again, new random numbers. But we will also see that in cryptography, there are cryptographic random number generators where if we will put in a small random number, so we need to start with some random number, that we can generate a large stream of numbers which are really hard to predict. We don't know a way to predict what the next random, what the next number will be. So we will say, this is a random number generator. And that's basically also, we will see it maybe actually on the next slide, it's how a stream cipher will work. But no, the next slide is a slightly different slide. So I hope it answers your question, right? Yes, okay. So first to summarize a bit, uh, we've now seen information theoretic secure uh, schemes and uh, some properties about them. And we, but we haven't seen computational secure encryption schemes, but this is what we will cover for the rest of the course. So information, information theoretic secure crypto schemes about the security, we can say they cannot be broken even if we have the most powerful computer in the world. And that was basically because hello and tally were both valid messages. So you could always think of a valid message for a certain cipher. So it doesn't matter how much you compute, you can 
every, every plain text is equally likely to have resulted in that ciphertext. But um, we will see in the in future lessons, uh, this is a super cool property. We really want to have this for all our crypto sch schemes, but because there are some drawbacks, which we already saw in the previous three slides, uh, information theoretic security is not often that used that much. Uh, so we will use computational security, computationally secure encryption schemes. And there for, we, for the security, we can say, well, we know in theory it can be broken, but only if you if you have the supercomputer which is as big as three Earth, three times the Earth, or if you have that much power. So, to to operate a computer, you need to have power. You need to have electrons in order to to compute something, and you would need to have three suns in order to com exhaustively search all possible uh, uh, possibilities to, to, to get to recover the, the, the underlying plain text. So with compute, uh, computational security, we, we know it can be broken, but it's in practice, it's infeasible. That's at least what we will aim for with computational security. Um, well, the, here there's a, a section assumptions. For information theoretic security, we don't need any assumptions. We know it's uh, the security will be good. So we don't rely on any assumption like something happening. It's in regardless of assumptions, we know security will work. But for computational security, we actually require some assumptions and these are hardness assumptions. That means that we know of a very difficult problem that we uh, that we know we, we don't know how to solve this problem. That's basically this infeasible number of operations. So we you can think, for example, think of the travels, traveling salesman pro, uh, pro problem or uh, factoring a super big number. Is we don't know an efficient way of doing this. And so that basically means. Um, well, we will see later on for computational security that if uh, we can base secure uh, encryption schemes on this hardness assumptions, meaning that uh, if we find a difficult, uh, an, an easy way to break, uh, to, oh, sorry, if we find, uh, for example, an easy way to factor large numbers, we can break RSA. But RSA, the security is just based Actually, it's not correct what I'm saying, but for now, just assume it's like this. RSA security is based on the hardness of factoring numbers. So RSA is secure up, uh, and, unless we are able to break, uh, we can factor big numbers. So that's this assumption. So in computational things, we will use assu complexity assumptions and for information theoretic uh, security, we don't even need assumptions. We, we can all unconditionally, it's always secure. Key size. This is now the, the disadvantage of information theoretic security because it needs to be at least, so sometimes it needs to even be bigger if you cannot otherwise create such an encryption scheme. Uh, as uh, it needs to be at least as big as the plain text. So we already saw that at these code books and uh, key distribution, it's sometimes a mess. So it's not really nice. But for computational security, we can do much better. We can find super small keys, like for RSA, it will be maybe uh, 4,000 uh, uh, bits long. For AES, it will be just in the order of two and a half uh, or 250, uh, six bits, or maybe even half of this uh, bits long. So this is a very low number of bits and we, we can already achieve something like computational security. Well, in the last uh, row will be, uh, are there are some examples. We have already seen one example of this information theoretic security scheme. That was the one-time path or Vernam cipher. And uh, hopefully we will also be able to cover at the, almost at the end of the, the course, uh, Shamir's secret sharing, uh, which is, a, is another 
nice scheme where you can share a secret among multiple people. And we, we also can prove that it's information theoretic. So nothing will leak about your message uh, if you share it under among some people. And for the computational um, uh, encryption schemes, we, for example, have AES as an example of a symmetric key encryption scheme, RSA as an example of a public key encryption scheme, and Elgamal, which is also an example of a public key encryption scheme. So this is a trade-off in, in, uh, in, in, in a trade-off we can think of between information theoretic security and computational security. But in practice, this is such an important thing that the keys, uh, the keys should be at least as large as the plain text. That is such a huge drawback of information theoretic security schemes that we won't, in practice, nobody will well, only in very limited cases, but in just the day-to-day -day communication, we will always rely on computational security. So AES, I, uh, RSA, Algamal, DES, Triple DES, they're all examples of computational security. Some are better than the other, but uh, they're all examples of computational security. Okay, so before we move on, what actually here I say uh, there is a difference data versus information. So there's a difference implying there is a difference between data and information. Does somebody already know right away what a difference between data and information is? Information has some value, I hear, as an uh, answer. Yes? Uh, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Okay, you were saying, what were you saying? As some processing on it, information. That's not really what I'm looking for. Maybe if I reveal some more questions, uh, it will be become clear. So, hey, Tim. Um... Yes. Data, it, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's Ricardo. Uh, data, it's, it's uh, unorganized and, and it's not really uh, for use to humans and information is actually processed. And then that, that's when we yes. actually pro process data as information, right? That's, that's, uh, there, there are all valid uh, explanations of uh, whether, what a difference between data and information, but uh, I will, I'm looking at a certain, at another, uh, difference <laughs> okay. between data and information, and hopefully it will become clear by asking these questions. So for first is, if I send, it, it, uh, when is there more information in a message than another? So if I send two messages, maybe one uh, message will have more information than another. And also, if I send the same message twice, will it give you new information or won't? And what is the, the, the general question what we're actually looking for is what, what determines the, the information density. So if I, have, if I tell you an endlessly long story, which I could also have told you in two sentences, then the, the information that I carry in that story is the same as in the two sentences, but the one is just a super long story, lots of data, and the other one is just two sentences, which is just small data. And yes, do you have a question or? Ah, oh, there's a, Samuel has a question, please. Oh, no, I was trying to answer the question. Maybe it's the context oh, that yes. makes the difference. Please go ahead. Oh, can you guys hear me? Hello? Yep, yes. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, for as far as you said, is that a content that makes the difference between the data and the in the information, that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, the, sorry, the final step or? Uh... No, the context. Is that context the answer or? Yes, uh, context is an important thing. N namely, I will just go on and answer it uh, using your, uh, your help. Um, it depends a lot of probability theory. If I tell you it rains outside and you're here in the classroom, I don't give you any new information because you can hear it rains outside. So 
the probability that it rains outside is one. You know that this occurring. But if the if the windows were closed and the blinds were down, and I told you it rained, then maybe you know uh, it's evening, so there's a probability of uh, eighty percent of raining, and it will give you the last twenty percent of information of this uncertainty that it will that it's raining outside. But maybe uh, so it depends a bit on what your expectation is, whether it's rain outside, whether this this is actually information to you or whether it's just already you knew this or you were completely 50% uh, chance of rain or so it, it has to do with probabilities. So what Shannon did, the, the guy who also formulated this, uh, is, uh, this uh, theorem that we saw before, he came up with a, def a definition of what is information. And actually, it's called entropy in uh, in his terms. And he he said, well, information is based on this probability. So if we have a random variable x, and it can take some values, uh, and then we have probabilities that it will take some value. So these are the probabilities that, uh, for example, it rains, it's sunny, it's windy, it snows outside. Um, and we, well, we do some conventions. Then we can define the entropy using this, for, this next formula, namely the probability of the event occurring multiplied by the, the logarithm of this event occurring and then summing over all probabilities and then making it negative. And then that's basically the probability, uh, the, the entropy, that's the entropy. So maybe first a question, uh, will this entropy, this H of some random variable X, will this be a positive or a negative number? Let's have a look. Uh, the probability will always be a number between zero and one. So that's a positive number. So we also have this here. If we take the logarithm from a number between zero and one, do you know what you get? You get a negative number bigger than one, likely. Um, so we get a negative number here, multiplied by a positive number. So it's a negative number. Then we sum everything. So negative sum, negative will be negative again. And we again have here a negative sign. So to make it positive, so the entropy will always be a positive number. We can also look at, um, maybe some extremes. I think those are on the next slide, uh, best to show them. Um, but let's, let's try if we can do them uh, without already revealing the next slide. Hope you don't cheat at home. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what, could, what could be a lower bound of, uh, when, when will this, is entropy the lowest? Maybe, we can think about what, what do we want to measure with entropy? We wanted to measure how uncertain something is or how much information something got. And if it's, if it's super uncertain, you get more information because I will, if you don't know whether it's raining at all outside and I tell you, then I give you a lot of information. So the entropy will be very high. So do you know how we can get to a, and okay, that's an upper bound. So uh, what I first wanted to ask about the lower bound. So when will I give you absolutely no, no, no useful information? So whenever it's equal to one. When n is equal to one, I hear. When, no, no. Whenever it's equal to one, when when the result is one. Uh, so the, the entropy will be one. You mean? Yep. That's the lower bound. Yep. Well, we, Let's see. Um, do you also know uh, when, wh wh what, what probabilities do we have to have in order to make this equal to one? Because then we can see indeed if this is when uh, this will occur. Uh, it could be when n is equal to one then. 
if n is equal to one, so yes, well, let's 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 have a look what what happens then. So then this sum will disappear. There will be only one probability, and the probability will equal one, one indeed, because we we only have one value, and we all probabilities need to sum to one. So we the probability will be one. So we will fill out here one, the logarithm of one. Be one, will right? be, yeah, uh, maybe Zero. it's minus one, or I think it's minus one because, um, yes, uh, two to the power one is one actually. Uh, is that two to the power of oh, zero? No, the logarithm is, is zero. zero, yeah, 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 zero, yeah, yeah zero. zero, yes. So, uh, one times zero is zero. And actually, we will get the 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 the, the entropy will be zero. So, well, I, this is not a formal proof, but we've seen now a case where the entropy will take a very low uh, bound, zero. And we already said before that it will be always higher or equal to zero. So actually, the lower bound is zero, and we have if we have certainty. So if if you already know it's raining outside, I and I tell you it's raining outside, you got no information. So entropy will be zero. The upper bound is a bit trickier, but let's see uh, if we can also uh, come up with uh, this already. So when, can, just think about uh, raining and uh, just this uh, information. Uh, when will I give you the most information whether it's raining outside? When n is big enough? When n is big enough? Yes, but it's it's either raining outside or it isn't raining outside. So, uh, and I tell you it's raining outside. When When are you the most surprised? When we don't know and then you tell us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it, um, I will tell you oh, now also the answer. <laughs> it is if you if you if if it's hat or tails to you whether it's raining outside. You have no clue. You didn't look at the forecast. You don't know it's night or yes or no. It it could be one over two whether it's raining, yes or no. And if I then tell you ah it's raining, oh, okay, you got a lot of information because. It could be dry or it could be raining. You had absolutely had no clue. It was half probability. So let's see if we have two cases. So n is two. What happens if we have a probability half? Well, then we have here uh, the the it will be half and half the logarithm of half. Can somebody compute this for me, please? Because I'm also terrible at logarithms, but I think it will be minus one. Minus one. Yes. one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so minus one times a half, and some that is that is of course uh, minus a half, and we have to do this twice because the other probability was also half. So we had uh, minus a half minus a half is minus one. Multiply it by minus, so we get the upper bound is one in this case. Now you might think. If you are not careful enough, you think, ah, the upper bound is always one, but that's actually not true because if we if we increase the n, it will also differ. So if we have four, it will be different. And actually, let's just review the answer right away. Um, uh, it, the, the, the upper bound is the logarithm of the, of, uh, the number of cases that we have. Um, Ah, yes, okay, we covered all uh, properties uh, just uh, ourselves already. So what we said is we have this non-negativity. So all uh, the entropy will always be a positive number or equal to zero. We also seen the lower bound. So it will the entropy will be zero. So you gain no information if it's completely deterministic. So we know this is occurring. So then you get no information. So the entropy will be zero. And we also saw an example uh, where, the, where the upper bound is met 
Um, and that is if every probability is occurring with the same probability. So if we have three cases, then the probability of case one occurring is one third, the case of probability two is occurring is one third, et cetera, or half, half in two pro cases, et cetera. Um, let's look at the time, uh, I think. Okay, let's let's go move on a bit a bit longer. So it's just stating some uh, boring definitions. I think there are two. Uh, first, let's have a look at the joint entropy. Uh, if we have two random variables, then the probability of the uh, of the joint distribution. So if we know x and y, then the entropy is defined as basically the sum over these two things and now the probability for this joint distribution. So it's just again the definition and we'll just see that this is something we define. Then we also have something as a conditional probability where we look at the condition, uh, conditional uh, probability. Uh, so we we'll, from the conditional probability, we also have conditional entropy. I'm not sure if I said it correct at first. Uh, and how is this defined? So the entropy from some random variable X occurring under with the under the condition of some random event Y occurred, that's defined as this the sum over all these possible values Y that it takes some value times a conditional pro, uh, entropy for a specific value Y. And now, of course, we we. We need to define what is the entropy under some specific value y. Well, that is uh, just this formula for the probability for x under a certain value y, and also the logarithm for this probability. So it's just definitions in order to 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 compute with entropy. And actually, that's what we will do. Okay, then I will also explain this one because here the proofs are homework. <laughs> so I don't explain actually that much. Um, we, we, if, we, if we apply these, prob uh, these, these definitions that we had before, we see that uh, the, joint the joint entropy of uh, random variables X and Y, we can also, that's exactly the same as the conditional entropy of X occurring under Y plus, the probability or the entropy that y is occurring. You could see already a bit with probabilities, with probabilities it's about the same. Then uh, also if the two random variables are independent, we actually know that it's the same with probabilities, right? A conditional probability that x occurs under the, under the event y, but if they're independent, then this doesn't matter. It's the same as the probability of thing. So for entropy, we have exactly the same formulas. Um, and also if X and Y are independent, we, we can just, the, the, pro, the entropy, just like the uh, uh, probability will be just the sum of these two entropies. These proofs are homework. So um, how to approach this, just look back at what, how the conditional and the joint probability were defined and then write out these formulas with the knowledge that they are independent or here it's holds always. So, and then you will hopefully come to the answer that actually indeed, if this, if this is the written out formula and you know that they're independent then you can derive that this is the case. And of course here, it's also written if and only if. So you need to prove from this uh, that if this holds that, then X and Y are independent. And also if X and Y are independent, then this formula holds. So remember that during your proofs. I think now is a nice time. It's a quarter two. Um, yes, let's have a break uh, here and then uh, we'll continue in, uh, let's say five two. Um, so I have a 10 minute break because otherwise I'm not sure if we will be able to make uh, the rest of the, of the, of the slides.
Thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, let's start uh, continuing with the class again because there will be the next slide will contain lots of formulas and we need to reason a bit about it to understand what we derive at. Uh, but first this slide question is going back. So now we've seen lots of things, definitions about entropy and Shannon theorem, but going back to cryptography. So what is the uh, question we can ask ourselves? What's the entropy of a Sarftex encry encrypted using a one-time path? So basically the question is how much information will a SARF text encrypted under a one-time path give you if, if uh, yes, uh, just give you if you just received the SARF text. Zero is, uh, is the answer here. Is everybody agreeing? And well, I also wrote, wrote a remark I, here. <laughs> I, yeah, I wouldn't agree to that because I mean, you get some oh. information, at least you know there's a message, right? So True, that's completely true. But uh, this is indeed, you, you get some information, namely first that there is a message and yep. second, you get the message length. So indeed you get some information, but yeah, we, we, we just take that as a given and we just, yeah, we don't consider that uh, also as well. So we just say this is leakage, but we are fine with this. But this is a very good point indeed. You review something, namely that there is communication and even how long the communication is. But yeah, with cryptography, you cannot hide this. So we say, well, too bad. <laughs> of course you can do padding and send fake messages all the time, but that's, that's not the real, that's not in the world of cryptography. That's just information hiding or steganography. Um, okay, so then just explaining this remark. Uh, so when soaring, uh, uh, using a uniformly random key with a deterministic, so not random at all, plain text, then actually we'll get a uniformly random result. So if we just have some fixed value and we XOR it with a uniformly random value, the outcome will be again uniformly at random. And that's why we also know when we have uniformly at random data, we, so every probability was equally likely to occur, we hit the upper bound of entropy. So actually, um, um, yes, we hit the upper. So it's, I formulated the question maybe wrong <laughs> because there is no information, but it's pure randomness. So in that sense, it contains a lot of information because it's only randomness that we, we computed on. So actually the entropy will be maximum in, uh, in the, the SARF text. And I think in two slides or maybe the next slide, no, and then after this slide, I will, I will show you some uh, more things. Uh, um, so if actually, yes. So here, if if we knew exactly this, what uh, what the underlying message was of a cipher text, then the entropy would be zero. Just like if you know it's raining, and I tell you it's raining, I give you no new information, so the you the information is zero. But here, because the SARF text is pure random, we, we just, you just get, it's as likely to be this message as this message, the entropy is super high. Yes. So actually I was, got also fooled. I thought, well, probably it's zero, but actually it's just the other, other upper bound. So let's have a look at, uh, this is a slide which will contain lots of formulas and we will derive some and we will come to a conclusion. So if we look at perfectly secure ciphers, we know that, uh, so, and we have some key, uh, sarf, plain text, sorry, keys and a sarf text. Um, then we know, let's say, what, what do we know what the, pro, uh, what the entropy is for a plain text? given some key and some SARF text. What, the entropy will be zero, which means that we, 
it's completely deterministic, so we go, don't get any new information. And why is that? If we have a SARF text and we get the key, we can decrypt the message so we know the plain text. So that's basically, but if our decryption scheme or encryption scheme is correct, meaning we can decrypt a SARF text, then of course we can recover the plain text so we don't get new information at all. So that's what this first formula says. Now we also have a second formula, which is very closely related. It says, given a SARF text, or you know, what's the entropy of a SARF text? given a plain text and a key. It says you don't get new information. Actually, this only holds if we use deterministic encryption. If we use deterministic encryption, that means that if we have a plain text and a key, we always get the same SARF text. If we would have used probabilistic encryption, then we could have gotten multiple SARF texts. Hope that's clear. That's the difference between prob probabilistic and deterministic. Hope, see a bit puzzled faces. Clear? Yes. Okay, good. Thanks. So if we have de deterministic encryption, we know also the entropy will be zero for this case. The SARF text will be fixed if we are given a plain text and a key. Now let's look at another formula. What is the entropy of the plain text, the key, the key, the well, the, the distribution of keys and the distribution of SARF text? Well, we can apply this formula that we saw uh, as a homework set. So maybe write it down here. That's just this formula where we had H of X and Y is the same as the conditional probability of X under y plus the probability of y. And of course, it will also work for three things. Now we just choose x to be, or p to equal x, and k and c, we just consider this joint uh, probability y, and we see exactly that it's just this formula applied here. So here we have x, that's the p, and y, plus y. Now we can also simplify this part because I think it's this one indeed. We know this, this, prob this not probability, sorry, this, uh, this uh, entropy value uh, will be equal to zero. So we actually know that the entropy of this pro of the plain text uh, key space and the SARF text will be just the same as the entropy of the key and the SARF text. So basically what we now know is this plain text actually doesn't contribute anymore. And that's also basically what we saw here because this, this is zero and we also use it actually here in this formula. But we can also derive another statement about this entropy P, K and C. Namely, we can swap out, we can apply this formula in a different way Namely, we choose now C equal to Y, uh, to X, sorry, and PK equal to Y. And then we again have uh, here, ah, yes, uh, the, the conditional. So that's the X is now C and Y is PK. And here we also have PK. So that's again Y. So we apply this formula another time, but now in different variables. And we also knew that uh, C under the condition of PK equals zero. So actually we know that this also equals uh, P, the, the entropy of P and K. Now we also apply another formula that we saw before. Let's go back uh, here. If uh, two con uh, random variables are independent, then the joint uh, entropy is just the same as the addition of these two entropies. I, I'm hoping uh, it's really the correct one. Yes, it's the correct one. So the 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 the, 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 the plain text is chosen independent from a key because we just 
it doesn't make sense to for certain plain text choose certain keys, right? We always choose a key uniformly at random. So these are indeed independent random variables. So we can apply the formula that we saw before. The, the joint entropy is the same uh, as the as the entropy of the two sum uh, sum together, to the two entropies sum together. So we now know that uh, the entropy of P, K, and C equals the entropy of K and C. And that equals as well the entropy of P plus the entropy of the key space. Plain text space, key space, etc. So we can use again these formulas to derive a new formula. Actually, we just see this equals this. So that's what we've written here. And now I believe this is the last important formula, or maybe maybe not yet. Uh, I don't know. We will see. <laughs> uh, we can also derive something else. Um, let me see. What did we do here? So I guess, yes. Um, so the, this is completely independent from the things that we've seen before. Uh, but the entropy of a, a, a key out of a key space under the condition of a, a given some ciphertext, we can just compute what that is using this formula again. That's why it's so an important formula. <laughs> uh, we can just, if we just take uh, uh, the K equals to X and uh, C equal to Y, then we can just see that hopefully you see that this to the other side is the negative here. So that's the, uh, the Y, which is the C. And we also have this. So we'll just apply this formula, but now in a different form, we just move some things around. And also what we know now before, because now we have here the entropy of the joint, uh, the joint entropy of K and C, or the key space and the ciphertext space, we already derived here some uh, properties about this. We can just plug this in in this formula. So we, now we know that the uh, conditional pro, uh, entropy of the key space under the condition of a certain ciphertext. Uh, we know that we just plug this in here, this in here. That is just the sum of the entropy of the key space plus the entropy of the, sorry, plain text space plus the entropy of the key space minus the entropy of the ciphertext space. And this is an important formula because this basically see, uh, tells you how much information is leaked after you, you revealed one ciphertext. So if you in, encrypt a message under, uh, uh, under a certain key, how much information is revealed? I think it's also here, yes. And this property is called, uh, I need to pronounce this correctly, key equivo e equivocation. Um, that's just this. This is just the entropy of a key given some ciphertext. So we review one ciphertext. How much do we learn about the key that was used in order to encrypt the ciphertext and a certain message? So that's basically the amount of uncertainty because entropy measures uncertainty of information uh, about, yeah, so the uncertainty about this key, if we review a ciphertext. And this is an important concept if we're reasoning about information theoretic security. In the book there, they even have an uh, entire example written out where they take some probabilities of some uh, and ciphertext and some plain text and uh, keys, and they derive some things. And maybe it's nice to read where you could actually see, ah, okay, indeed. Now this number is saying how much you leak if you reveal this ciphertext. And if you would have revealed another ciphertext because it had some other probabilities, then you would have leaked less information. So just read in the book about this, uh, this topic and you will uh, get maybe a better understanding of why this is a nice thing to measure how much information is leaked if you if you just use your encryption encryption scheme. 
Okay, so move on to entropy of a natural or of a language. So again, just a boring definition. Let me also check how much time, okay. Um, I'm not sure how much slides I have less left. Okay, yes, I think uh, maybe we even finish a bit before time. Um, so ent a definition, entropy of a language could be a natural language, like I said before, but it could also be just this computer science uh, definition of a language. And that's defined as, uh, well, taking the entropy for all different n-grams, uh, so letter frequencies, bigrams, and trigrams, just take this for granted, divided by uh, the number of, yeah, one letter or two letters, et cetera. So maybe it's helpful first to explain uh, what is uh, an, an n-gram. Um, actually, you should have hopefully read this if you read the, the chapter that was written as homework, because I believe it's explained there. Um, so we, in the in the previous uh, lecture where we used where we tried to break ancient ciphers, we used letter frequency in order to get some information about the language, the the English text, etc. We counted just how often a letter occurred. But actually, you can also do better. You can also count how many times a, a combination of two letters occurs, and then use that in your statistics of language. So for example, in the English language, the, the combination TH occurs way more often than the, the combination TX. So that gives you quite some information. If you do just some statistics about a plain text that you get, you know, okay, TH is far more likely to occur than TX. So if you receive a lot of TX in your plain text, probably it's not the correct plain text. And you can also do this again, extend this for three letters. So I believe in English, it's very common also to have ing because lots of words ending in ing, uh, but also the is used is sometimes in other words or it's also just the word the. So it's also occurring very often in English. So there are also trigrams, so combination of three words of le three letters uh, occurring more often. And you can do this for n number of characters. So that's an n-gram. So an, a unigram is just counting letter frequencies, bigrams is just the two, trigrams, three, etc. That's just what n-grams were. Now returning to this definition, the entropy of a language we can define as the entropy of an, an unigram divided by one plus, ah, oh, no, actually uh, there's no sum. There's, uh, it's just a limit. So indeed, if we, if we just take S, uh, N grams for super huge N, then, uh, well, but we cannot, of course, in practice, we cannot compute this for a super high N because we only can compute it maybe for the first lacquer frequencies, then maybe we can compute it for bigrams, but for trigrams, there will be already lots of computational power just to compute all possible trigrams because there are lots of different possibilities. Maybe even four grams, it will be more difficult, etc. But if we take this limit, then we say this is, this is the entropy of a natural language. And this also makes sense Right, because um, the more letters we consider in in uh, in uh, for computing something about a uh, about a language, the more information we take. So the better we define entropy for a language. So otherwise, if you didn't get this intuition, just take this as granted. It's just a definition. We just define entropy for a language like this. For English language, for the English language, you might expect, well, we have 26 letters, if we just disregard cases. Um, you just have this, 
you, you can just apply this. So this formula, and you might expect, well, the, 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 this is just the entropy for the English text, which is just uh, one over 26 times uh, the logarithm of one over 26. Um, and then for all this summed up. So for for the English language, you might expect, okay, this 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 will probably be uh, actually, yes, it will be probably four point seventy as a as a thing, or about five bits of entropy for the English language. But actually, if you do all the hard work and compute this for lots of super high engrams, you will find that actually the English language has a way lower entropy, meaning that the this English is actually quite verbose. So yeah, I need to use lots of letters in order to explain you something. Well, we could have done maybe way more efficient with letters and explained you something with a very condensed text, exactly the same amount of information. So English is quite verbose. We can also compute this for Spanish. I believe I've done that. No, oh, I haven't done that. Ah, to, ah, because actually, that's why, because this is really hard to compute because you need to do it for super high n-grams, right? So, and I didn't find this online to, uh, you, and well, you need to have a big corpus and do all the work in order to find this number. So that's why I only have it for English and I think I took it even from the book. Okay, so what now? We have some English language, so some English text, uh, and we encode it as uh, UTF-8. And we can compute, of course, the entropy of this uh, message. Uh, so how do we do this? We, we know which bit, or sorry, byte, the letter S correspond to, because it's this ASCII um, and they're just actually only ASCII characters, so UTF-8 doesn't matter, it's just ASCII, or maybe actually here there's a non-ASCII character, I don't know. But you can compute now the, the entropy for a certain text, and you will find actually this is way higher than we said before. Because we said, oh, English text has probably an entropy between one and one and a half. But remember, this is English text, which doesn't consider punctuation, no spaces, just only unicase uh, letters. So it, actually in computer science, when we're doing stuff with computers and text encoding and stuff like this, you see that the entropy will be higher than this 1.5 of the actual English text. And this, this so this text apparently just, this, this, literally this this block of text has this entropy this is i hope it's clear we can just compute from a block of text the entropy right we can just this this is just an an uh, we can com convert this letter s to the byte value and we can convert the letter o to the byte value and we just can count how many times the, let, the capital letter S occurred in this text, well, probably only one time. And we can count how many times the small letter O occurred in this text, well, multiple times. Uh, we can compile uh, the same for spaces, etc. And we can just go for all 256 bytes. We can just compound, co co uh, compute how often that byte occurred in this text. And then we can just say, well, these frequencies we consider probabilities, so we can just apply this uh, this formula for entropy, which was the probability, or in this case, frequency times the log, the two log of the probability slash frequency, and then sum all these probabilities. Uh, com well, p times the logarithm of p together, and then negate this, and we get to some number. So that's just what we did here and just wanted to show you that if we just consider also uh, 
put uh, other other symbols and spaces and uppercase lowercase we get actually way higher than just english text because english text we only consider unicase characters now um i want to say something about entropy is actually a very useful way of saying uh, to learn something if some if some data is encrypted or whether it's maybe not properly encrypted or maybe it's already decrypted and that is because the entropy tells us something about the information or also the probability and actually more a bit of like how chaotic a text is so a text is very chaotic or random if every character is occurring as likely as any other uh, character and actually that's what we want for encryption because we want to we don't want to review any information so if we have an encrypted text with only a's and uh, then three b's well probably that reveals a lot of information that we first have lots of a's and then three b's well if there were just a's and b's all mixed together well, then it just looks like random and you reveal very little information about what was encrypted. So the higher the entropy, the more likely a chunk of data is encrypted. Uh, the lower the entropy, it's likely not English text, <laughs> but there's a sweet spot in the middle, which uh, it's very likely to be a natural language. And Actually, so just like I did on the last slide where I just had this text, you can easily compute this with uh, some websites uh, which you can easily find online called Cyberchef. This is also a clickable link in the PDF. Um, and that's really nice. Uh, maybe I told it also last lecture or maybe not, but I really love this, uh, this website. You can do it also for CTFs and uh, it just contains all these nice things where you can do AES encryption in the browser and uh, stuff like this and encoding, decoding, and also computing entropy. And so just to summarize again, what, was, what, what does it mean to compute entropy of some certain text? Well, if we get an entropy of zero, we, we basically get that all bytes are the same because the probability of a certain byte occurring is one. So, and then we got this, this, under, this lower bound of entropy, meaning that we got zero. So the text has no randomness at all. If it's eight, we know that the text is uniformly, is, is completely random. Why eight? Because we operate on bytes here. So we just take a byte and that is the log, log the, the, the two log of, a byte or 256 is just giving you eight. It's just eight bits, right? A byte is eight bits. So basically entropy will, if you operate only on bytes, which CyberChef does, then it will, the, the upper bound will be eight. So it will always be a value between zero and eight if you operate on bytes. So um, if CyberChef shows you that uh, the entropy is eight, then it means that every character is as likely to occur as any other character. So everything is uniformly at random distributed. That's another way of saying it. Was there a question from the online or? Okay, good. Then I will just move on. Then uh, there are some helpful things uh, just that we know from practice. If uh, the entropy is super high, but not eight, because well, if you can only get eight if every byte is occurring exactly n times. Um, but if they're roughly occurring about the same time every byte, then we have a higher, very high entropy. Then it means that either the data usually is either encrypted, so like we said, then we get super chaotic data, or it's compressed. And what? Why could it be also compressed? Because what we do do we do if we compress data? Then we have uh, information, which we first describe very verbosely, and we just make it in a very small packet. And we, it still contains the exact same information, but now it's super small and 
well, with high entropy, it's, it's, there's a lot of information in this small set of data. So hopefully it's also clear that actually the entropy will be also super high if we use compression. So you can even upload files to CyberChef. So you can upload a zip file and a text file, and you can just experiment to see how the entropy changes if you want. And then CyberChef uses this range. It says then only for English text, but I would even extend this to all natural languages written in Roman script that the entropy is usually between three and a half and five. Why Roman script? Because if you, for example, have Chinese, then you use multi-byte characters and things will get messy. So um, if you use just UTF-8 languages or actually uh, most uh, ASCII languages, then you have end up mostly in these uh, ranges for um, entropy for a certain piece of text. Okay, um, then let's have a look at symmetrically crypto, not necessarily um, information theoretic secure crypto anymore. So just symmetrically crypto. So we are done now with the, with the entropy part. Uh, I just want to tell a small step to the stream ciphers because that we'll, we will also cover soon. And um, stream cipher is very close to this one-time path that we've seen, but then the computational version of it. So again, let's just recall uh, the encryption. We just denote with encrypt of some message using some key and decrypt. We just use the same key uh, to recover the message. Then basically for symmetric key crypto, there are two main uh, schemes that we could use, namely stream ciphers and block ciphers. The main difference between the two is that stream ciphers operate over a stream of data. So every single symbol, so it will encrypt every char character by character, a piece of text. And block ciphers actually operate over a chunk of blocks or of characters. So um, for example, if you could have a, a stream cipher for, to encrypt the message, hello, then a stream cipher would first encrypt the letter H, then the letter E, then the letter L, then another letter L, and then the letter O. But the block cipher would maybe just take the first two characters, H, E, and turn that into a cipher text, and then get these two Ls and co convert that into a cipher text, and then O, and probably it would need some padding, so it needs to have some uh, value here and then turn that into a SARF text. So there are just two different mechanisms that are used in uh, encryption, uh, symmetric key encryption. Now for the stream cipher, um, we, we can easily define how this is in general terms, how this works. It's basically generating a stream, so a series of random bits. And we use these random bits as a key to encrypt a message using the XOR operation. So it's very likely or very, very much the same as uh, the one-time path, because in one-time path, we use the message and we XOR it using the key. But the difference is in the one-time path, the key was chosen uniformly at random. And we just, out of all possible keys, we just choose a very random key. But here we generate a key from some algorithm, namely the stream, the stream cipher, that's actually the algorithm to generate these random bits that we use as a key. So that's why this can, so you can plug in some value into this random uh, key generator or stream cipher, uh, and that will be a short initial key. And then it will just give you lots of random numbers and that we'll, we'll use as true random, although it's not really true random. And that's why it's also not information theoretically secure, but only computationally secure. We will just use these random bits to encrypt the message. Yeah. So it's very much the same as, a, as the one-time path, but then the computational uh, variant of it. So then I also have one more slide. 
uh, are actually two more. Considering uh, this, uh, this uh, encryption schemes, we, we, we always construct encryption schemes using the Kirchhoff's principle, or actually uh, Shannon's maxims, so it's a slightly different uh, uh, variation, but usually people refer to this maxim as a Kirchhoff's principle. Mm -hmm. And that is that if we define an encryption scheme, we just publish everything about how to encrypt a message. The only thing we kept secret is, of course, the message itself and the key. So we keep the plain text secret and the key itself, but the way how we converted the plain text into the SARF text, that's just public knowledge. And why, why is this such a, this is, this is one of the fundamentals, foundations, sorry, of uh, uh, cryptographic research. And why is this so important? because now other people can study how the encryption works and can find attacks. And if nobody is able to find attacks on your crypto system, you know it's secure, or at least you hope that everybody is honest, at least in the academic world, nobody knows how to break your encryption scheme. So this is very important because now lots of people can look at your algorithms and see, ah, okay, really it's, uh, it's secure. One question with the microphone, indeed. Good. Um, yeah. Hi. Here's the thing if they are public and everybody knows them, it's because then, okay, um, they can make sure it's secure, right? Because many people will be looking at it. But the way I see it, if I have like my own crypto system and nobody else has, so in, in a way, I could think that is more secure that what is out there. Yes. Y you know what I mean? Yes. So in, in, in computer science in general, you, you, you have the concept of security through obscurity. So for example, if you have uh, your software program and you compile it and you say, well, now it's compiled, now you cannot see the co source code anymore. So it's better than just releasing the source code and let everybody compile it by itself. But this is giving you often a false sense of security because if now somebody is really deterministic to get back to, for, for example, of this code uh, program, get back to the source code, you can just load your program into IDA Pro, decompile it, and he has some source code which he can analyze. And then, so it, it's an extra step. So it's making it difficult, but it's not ad adding that much security for a deterministic attacker. So that's why in crypto, we already assume everybody knows how to encrypt. We just even publish it because it doesn't add that much security. And we are way more happy if people, other people, other cryptographers are able to study the, the crypto system then if they first have to reverse engineer and find out how it works and then have to study it. So they just skip, they already say, ah, here, study it, please see if it's secure. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it, it does, but um, it, it, it's always tricky. I, I think they, there might be people out there that they just don't publish it. True. Maybe, I don't know, NSA or I don't know. Could, know. It could be. So for example, uh, maybe uh, there are some crypto systems that are broken they need by the NSA, but then at least in the academic world, nobody knows an attack. And there right, are right, right. way more people in academia than working for the NSA, at least I hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, I think there was actually color, but maybe it's, yeah, the projector doesn't show it uh, that nicely. Uh, but uh, in this, so for a stream cipher, you know, this is public knowledge. So how the, uh, the stream cipher works, so how to generate the randomness. It's public knowledge that we saw it. The cipher text will be public knowledge, but only these two parts, they will be hidden. So only the key will be unknown to an attacker and the plain text will be unknown to an attacker. And then 
well, everything else will be uh, will be visible. So in the picture, there, this block and this block had a different color. Um, yes, I believe this is then the last slide of the lecture, maybe. I don't know. Let's see. Um, ah, yes. So because in the future, we will first actually next class, we will look at security models. But after that, we will look at uh, first stream ciphers and after that block ciphers. But uh, so just to get a bit of background knowledge on streams, stream ciphers already is these stream ciphers, they, we use computational security for those. So what are some requirements? Non-exclusive list I wrote here as well, but requirements that we should at least have for these random streams that are generated is that this random stream should have a very long period, meaning that you don't want to have repetitions easily. So for example, remember the vision year cipher, we only use keys of length three. So every third character will be encrypted using the same way. So we don't want this. We want to have a very long random key to encrypt messages with uh, so that we cannot easily do this uh, letter frequency analysis like we do for vision year cipher. But basically a stream cipher is the same as a vision year cipher, right? The only difference is that we just generate a very large key. Then another requirement of this stream cipher is that the, the, the random characters or random bits that we generate, they should be indistinguishable, indistinguishable from just picking out random bits at, compute, purely at random using statistical noise or whatever. Because if the key stream is not completely random, that means again, that we, we, we will leak some information about this underlying message because we can now, if we say, well, probably uh, it's more likely that uh, we, we encrypt it with uh, three A's in a row, then we just can try to decrypt it with three A's in a row and we get maybe part of a plain text. So really we want to this, be this uh, as close as possible to, really random that we cannot predict. Then another requirement, which is close to this one, but it's still different, is that the key stream should not be predictable. So that means that if we, if we get the first 10 bits of output of the key stream, we shouldn't be able to predict what the next thing is. So maybe we know, for example, that a, a, a message uh, always starts with, hi, uh, headquarters, uh, how are you doing? Uh, then uh, we can actually recover the key stream because we, we, that's how this soaring works, right? Um, if we had um, the ciphertext is the message sort with the key. If we know the ciphertext and we know the message, we can just sort the ciphertext and the message and we get the key. So if we do, if we had, for example, if we know a message, it always starts with hello, uh, nice, uh, whatever, um, then we can recover the first part of a key stream. And that's why we don't want to be able to, if we have part of the key, that we can predict the rest of the keys, because then we can suddenly decrypt the rest of the message. So this is a really important requirements. And actually this nice question in the lab, you will see a, an, uh, an, an, some guy who puts a uh, paper on archive. I'm not sure if you know the website archive.org uh, where everybody can put their papers online before they are peer, re peer reviewed. So lots of academic people just publish their papers there but also some non-academics. And this guy, poor guy, he thought he had a great, cool, nice random number generator that was even securely uh, for cryptographic purposes. And so he put it on archive saying, ah, nice, it's a really good random number generator. And uh, you, you really can use it safely for cryptographic purposes. And then he just did a proof like this like, mm, yes, it looks difficult. So I think it's uh, secure. 
And then we put it out there and said, well, free free to use. But if actually, if you study how this, uh, um, how this random number generator works, that's actually the homework that you have to do. There will be also a hint, which probably you, everybody will click right away because it's really hard to study yourself. But there is an explanation on a stack overflow for crypto, crypto stack overflow, which explains how to break this uh, secure random this secure random number generator and during this lab there will be an assignment where you first have to recover first bit of the key stream and if you just have some very small bit of the key stream you can recover the rest of the key stream and you can decrypt the entire message so two lessons we learned uh, first lesson is don't trust just random people on the internet, what they wrote there. there. And second lesson that we learned is just your, 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 your random number generator should really at least, so it's non-exclusive, at least have these properties to... Uh, to yeah, and if, if, if Stack Overflow gives you a correct answer, you can trust that. <laughs> um, so uh, that's uh, that's the end of this uh, lecture. Uh, please read chapter nine, which is about entropy, and then the first two sections of chapter ten, which will be about historical stream ciphers. But I don't expect you to read this. If if you read the, the chapter about the enigma, definitely also read the chapter about historical stream ciphers because you might find this interesting as well. But uh, only the first two chap uh, sort of two sections are important to uh, have the understanding what a stream cipher is. So that's why I also included these last slides of what a stream cipher is. That's also explained in the book in these two first sections. Um, then there will also be a new homework set. Um, I already referred to in this uh, in the slides where you had to prove uh, some properties um, of the. Um, of the of the things take note that uh, the homework isn't due by next week it's actually due by next week monday so it's not next monday but the monday after that uh, um, so you have one and a half week at a time uh, finally like i said already here if you're interested in historical stream ciphers then you can also read the entire part of uh, chapter 10 but it's not required and won't be part of the exam or any uh, of those topics. So Asash? still we finished a bit early, but there's also one more question. So uh, please uh, uh, shoot. A uh, question, yeah. Uh, for the prior slide that you you showed, so that one should be the test for the 20, John 20s as well? Sorry, the test that... Uh, they... there's, an, there's another homework, right? On the prior slide that you show, that you show in the beginning of the class, maybe? Or I uh, was sooner, you mean, I think. This oh, yeah, slide... that one, oh yeah, you just passed that thing. Ah, I already passed it? Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, yes, you... this one. Yeah. Where the proofs are homework. Yeah, that one should be for the 20th as well, or for the June Sorry? 20th? June's 20th. Trainees? June. I mean, uh, for the next next Monday. Ah, uh, so this no, it's not. Uh, you, I don't expect you to uh, complete this homework by next uh, Monday. Okay. So, but just I, I haven't uploaded it to Tech Digital and also not to Slack. Okay. But I will soon after this will upload it, and then you will see that the there there are also also the dates. Every, every homework at the top of the PDF, it will say when you have to hand it in, and it will oh, be. Sorry. You're gonna put all together and then just upload into Tech Digital, right? I will also make it available in Tech Digital, yes. And I okay. hope after this lecture I will be taught how this system works. Okay, okay, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions online or offline? One more question offline. I have a question. I just uh, wanted to point out uh, something about the the probabilities and the entropy concepts uh, we studied in today's lecture. I wanted to point out that this is obviously extremely important for cryptography, as obviously we are studying it here. 
but there are other subdomains in cybersecurity where this is really, really important. Uh, for example, if you want to do uh, uh, intrusion detection systems, of course, an intrusion detection system consists in um, monitoring events and detecting when there is something out of normal. And that is based in probabilities, right? You create a normal of normalcy, and what sometimes goes out of your model, then right, you, you got an alert there. And yeah, there are many other applications for reverse engineering. You might need some of these probability and entropy concepts. So all the time that you invest in studying these probability and entropy concepts will really, really help you for the rest of your career in cybersecurity. This is really a building block here. Yes, thank you for that addition. Um, then uh, it only rests me to say that uh, this was the last physical lecture that it will be here. So the next lectures, I will record uh, them and upload them uh, so you can watch them just at your own time. And uh, so there won't be any live uh, recordings or live sessions anymore. Of course, if you need to ask something, just use the Slack, uh, then you can uh, reach uh, me or uh, for questions if you have those. Okay, well, thanks uh, for uh, attending or this. Ah, okay, Samuel, uh, please shoot. Uh, sorry, uh, one more question. Uh, yes. The format for that, uh, homework can we just choose any or, or it has to be like on latex uh you could choose any but please submit it as a pdf as a pdf okay gotcha. yes and if 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 you really prefer to write proofs on with pen and paper just make a picture scan it as a, and hand it in as a pdf mm -hmm. i rather have that you write it nicely digitally or with a pen on a wacom tablet or whatever Digital is always better to have than pictures. And best is, of course, LaTeX, because I'm a real huge fan mm -hmm. of LaTeX. But yeah. if that's not your cup of tea, it's also fine in other ways. OK, cool. Yeah, thank you. OK. Uh,